Welcome to this webinar hosted by a different booklist cultural center. This is part of the Literary Salon series and our guest today is Angela Punky Stultz, who is the author of Signs and Wonders, Sojourn in the Inner City, Stories of Triumph and Trials in Community Development and Peace Building. Now this webinar is being recorded for upload on a different booklist cultural center's website and you can visit adbcc.org to see more of our recorded events and find out when future events are taking place. You can also share your thoughts about today's event by using the hashtag, hashtag ADBCC events and hashtag the lit salon. If you have any questions or comments, please type these into the Q&A box and we will read them aloud during the Q&A session. Your questions will come directly to us and will not be viewed by other participants. You can also send questions to ssv.adbcc at gmail.com. That's ssv.adbcc at gmail.com. I'm Neil Armstrong and it is my pleasure to be hosting this literary salon with Angela Punky Stultz. Now let me tell you about her. She is for over 20 years, she has worked in community transformation, gaining expertise in NGO management and strategic planning, police engagement and security programs, peace building, youth empowerment and social inclusion with attention to gender and vulnerable groups. And her work in inner city communities has given her a deep understanding of inner city culture and methodologies and approaches that work. Signs and Wonders Sojourn in the Inner City that I have here and read and thoroughly enjoyed, recounts the journey of one woman and one NGO in an inner city Jamaican community beset by crime and violence. It is a collection of 10 stories of people's hope, and resilience, tangible interventions, and the triumphs and seeming miracles in the face of trials and despair. Welcome, Angela. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks to Aita and the team, a different booklist um, culture, for having me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, the, the, the stories in, in, in your book, they cover a 15-year period of your work. And I'm wondering why did you write this book and, and how did you select the stories to tell? Because, because they, they deal with what I consider the intersectionality of, of race, class, colorism, gender. Tell, tell me what inspired you to, to write it. Yes, um, good question. Thank you for asking, um, Neil. The, the Escona organization and community development program, which I managed for over 15 years, has been recognized nationally throughout the region and internationally for the work that we did in community transformation, as well as individual empowerment. And um, the question is always asked, how do we do? What made Escona stand out from the different NGOs or CDOs that was operating mm -hmm. at the time in the achievement that we made? Mm -hmm. So I was inspired to write mm -hmm. so that I could, so this could be used mm -hmm. as a teaching, teaching tool for social workers. Mm -hmm. The practices could be replicated in our community development program. Mm -hmm. I thought it was important to talk about the stories that would that inspired that would inspire others to um of the life of inner city um person mm -hmm. um how did i the second question how did i choose the stories mm -hmm. um Escola used a multifaceted approach to address poverty because as you know poverty is very complex mm -hmm. have complex issues and it manifests differently um, the education um lack or lack of education mm -hmm. unemployment Antisocial behavior, violence, mm -hmm. violence, 
and social degradation, you know? Mm -hmm. So in order to talk about the best practices, mm -hmm. programs that help to alleviate those problems, mm -hmm. it, it, it came together. So the stories were selected based on my need to highlight the programs, the best practices that addressed, for example, the social ills, whether it was education, teenage pregnancy, violence or what. So that kind of eliminated what, do, what I don't talk about and what I really zoom in on because of the purpose of the book. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, now, of course, you, you mentioned that you were the executive director of S Corner Clinic and Community Development Organization in, in one of Kingston's most marginalized neighborhoods, uh, Waltham, the Waltham Park community in Kingston 13. And I'm wondering why, why did you choose community development and peace building as, as your career path? Um, good question again. Why did I choose community development? I can answer what not peace building. I think peace building chose me. Okay, okay. <laughs> in that, in trying to address, address issues of social degradation. Mm -hmm. poverty. When persons are living in abject poverty, then it's almost as if the antisocial, the violence and so on come into being. Mm -hmm. I think from an early age, for myself, I, I found my purpose. Mm -hmm. and my purpose was to work at leveling the playing field. Mm -hmm address the issues of social inequalities and inequities. Mm -hmm. and, and so being that as a Rastafarian and a spiritual person, mm -hmm. understanding what my purpose was, mm -hmm. I do social work first, and then I mastered in management studies mm -hmm. as a means of managing social work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in working in community and working at community transformation, mm -hmm. we could not ignore the issue of Peace, because if you want to create a stable environment in which people can live, mm -hmm. have addresses that they can be proud of, then you have to address all the areas that needed to be improved to create that mm -hmm. kind of stability. So peace building and peace became a part of the work in community stability. Right, right. Yes, yes. Your, I... I love the chapters and I love the fact that you started out by telling us about your childhood. Uh, this wonderful relationship that you had growing up with your, your grandparents, your, your, par your, your parents are off to, to London, London, England, and, yes. and, and, and they played a major role in your life, your grandparents, especially your, your grandfather who sort of sheltered you in many ways <laughs> tell, tell me what what was what how, how how so what what kind of role do you you see them playing in your life um papa my papa mm -hmm. <laughs> um a lot of persons as you know in the caribbean um grew up with their grandparents because their parents went in search of a better life and traveled off migrated to england at the time of america, america Canada. Mm -hmm. And so my mother left me at an early age with my grandfather. Mm -hmm. And uh, I became his favorite. Mm -hmm. And because the first grandchild, I think he kind of grew me like a tomboy. And took everywhere with him. Mm -hmm. So my grandfather was very politically aware. Mm -hmm. He was way ahead of his time in understanding the inequalities that persons of African descent faced. Mm -hmm from our history of slavery and colonialization and so on. Mm -hmm. So for him, it was the knowledge that we are all born as humans. Mm -hmm. And we have a natural birthright to access all the resources equally. Mm -hmm. That's where it stops. Mm -hmm. um, it is controlled, mm -hmm. hated to, based on the address that you live, your race, mm -hmm. gender, mm -hmm. All the religion and all those things that serve to divide persons and create a system of inequality. Mm -hmm. And so he was very vocal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When after, after church, growing up as a Roman Catholic, and see, going to the church at that time and seeing where the 
colored person, the black person sat on one side. Mm -hmm. The Caucasian sat on one side. Mm -hmm. If we are serving the same Jesus and the same God, mm -hmm. the is within this, the church. Mm -hmm. So after church, as usual, would always stop at the bar. Mm -hmm. And I would be there with him and be privy to the conversation that he was having with his friends to discuss about the political situation, the inequalities and race and class divide and all of that. Mm -hmm. Very young age mm -hmm. was more privileged to having learning and listening to those conversations than my, than my peers. Mm -hmm. That prepared me for the person I later became and wanting to do something about it. Mm -hmm. So I think that my early age with my grandfather mm -hmm. prepared me for the work that I would later um, do. And that's what you're talking about, purpose. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I sometimes we are guided towards our purpose by other persons. And my grandfather was the person who guided me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my ancestor, I dictated my mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I, I like how I like how in in the bar settings you you were supposed yes. to be in the corner reading while oh, yeah. you, while you were listening. Yes. <laughs> and I should talk about that. How could I not say that? Because thank you, Neil. My father understood that in order to break the ceiling, in order to for self actualization and acceptance, the only way to that was education. Mm -hmm. But he instilled in me a love for books. I had to read. I was forced to read. I was reading the Bible. I was I'm not just reading, but I had to tell the story of what I understood from that chapter. Mm -hmm. Understood from reading. Comprehension mm -hmm. and critical thinking was important. Mm -hmm. So when he took me to the bar, it wasn't for me to just listen. As a matter of fact, I was told not to listen. It was just that's, that's right that I was listening because always he would place me on a stool to sit down mm -hmm. in front of me. Well, this is going to give away my age, but the Pepsi bottle at that time was very large. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. He would give me my Pepsi or mm -hmm. Coca-Cola and I would sit there in the corner, mm -hmm. a book and reading and sipping while he and his friends would be in this animated discussions mm -hmm. about life and politics and religion and so on and so forth. So I had to read. I was forced to read. And he told me mm -hmm. that read, just just read. Mm -hmm. read quickly. And that's why the name I had to not just say handle the stones, but I had to put in the punti because that's for my grandfather. He mm -hmm. said read punti, read because mm -hmm. reading. Mm -hmm. And it's long before Marcus Garvey did he said um knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was very aware of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My grandfather was not just um, politically aware, but he understood mm -hmm. that in order for self-actualization, for all, in order for any improvement, mm -hmm. to make any difference in one's life, then you had to acquire knowledge. You had mm -hmm. to read. Yes, yes. I mean, feel that in me. Mm -hmm. then became a hobby. I age nine, I was I had finished off the Nancy Drew series. I had finished off the Hard Boys, and and couldn't wait for more to come out. The, the books couldn't. Last <laughs> <laughs> for me to read. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for reading, and and that yes. Yes, I, I what 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 struck me in that chapter as well was was how he how he understood the the isms how colorism oh. works. In the in the community and how that impacted him to the point where he couldn't he couldn't get a loan from from the bank yes. and yes yes, yes. yeah because he had he had um my grandfather worked in the Panama Canal and he came home with this sum of money mm -hmm. we could live quality of life in mm -hmm. our neighborhood yes for the rich ones and um, but he still could not get a loan. Mm -hmm expand on his business ventures that he had mm -hmm. and complained bitterly that it was and he knew mm -hmm. complaining just like that he knew right. that Chinese mm -hmm. getting loans at that time mm -hmm. to expand on their grocery shops and their businesses mm -hmm. as a 
dark-skinned black man was not given that same privilege and that same service. Mm -hmm. He understood the deep meaning based on his experience of how classism and racism mm -hmm. even at that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, so 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 being a part of those discourse and listening to him, mm -hmm. acutely aware mm -hmm. of all that and, and my own experience mm -hmm. in going to school and and um coming first, second in, in the class and, and the doll mm -hmm. given to someone else of a lighter shade mm -hmm. when given the smaller one. So mm -hmm. um yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And and colorism and um and racism mm -hmm. is alive and well from then and even today that mm -hmm. experience and that is why it is so important that we use education mm -hmm. as a tool of amendment mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. confidence in all that we assimilate in any society and have a right to live a dignified life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Now you, you, you celebrate community through your stories, which, which mm -hmm. delve into the lives of individuals, the, the social deprivations they live with and how they, they persevere. And uh, I, I want viewers and listeners to, to get a sense of, of how you craft the stories. So I'm wondering if you can share just a short excerpt for us from, from the chapter Woman, Woman Power. Okay. All right. Well, um, that's one of my favorite stories because it has so much, um, it is a story of triumph, of mm -hmm. resilience to get out of her situation. Mm -hmm. Her situation through the acquisition of a skill. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very glad that you've asked me to read that story. Let me find it, okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and she was, as you know, severely, because you have read the story, this is someone who was really abused and changed their life chances based on the skills that they have and their resilience, as well as most importantly, the support of other women who mm -hmm. understood what it was to be abused. And she served as a mentor that if she could leave that abusive situation, so others could really follow. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll read a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Domestic violence in which married or common law spouses beat or rape their partners is rampant and accepted norm in many inner city communities. This in no way suggests that domestic violence is exclusive to the inner city as it cuts across all strata of the Jamaican society. Above the crossroads clock, many in suits beat their tea party going to let her wearing wives with the same enthused vigor and self-appointed power within the confines of their gated mansions. The victims generally display similar behavior of denial of their situation. At the community level, the acceptance of domestic violence in relationship as a way of life influences neighbors to look the other way mm -hmm. and not to intervene unless they believe the situation to be life mm -hmm. And then we talked about um, this Labor Day project, as you know, in Jamaica, May the 23rd is National Labor Day and um, the community, everyone come together, mm -hmm. identify a project that would benefit the community. Mm -hmm. This Labor Day, we identified uh, this person, Marcio, mm -hmm. was in that situation to help to construct a house for her. Mm -hmm. uh, but before that, mindful that the community was comprised of 54% female-headed household mm -hmm. and mindful of the responsibilities placed on, on all women because of their gender, mm -hmm. the organization partnered with the Women's Construction Collective to train women in construction skills. Mm -hmm. We choose to train women in construction to provide them with a skill that would address sanitation in their community. More importantly, 
This would enhance their opportunities to find employment, have a sustainable income, and enable them to make choices for themselves and their families. Marcio was one of these women. Marcio and 23 other women completed training and constructed the first set of ventilated improved pit toilets in Jamaica. And that was some pit toilets that we got funding and these toilets were approved by World Health Organization, mm -hmm. built in communities in the absence of water, mm -hmm. um, so that they could be used and the feces afterward would be transformed into manure. A very um, scientific process. Mm -hmm. Built over 100 of them, and Marcia was one of the chief mason. Mm -hmm. um, and so we chose her. We did this construction of her house. Mm -hmm. In one day, with the community's help, we mm -hmm. were able to... to um, to do it but i got time to, to read some more you yes just a, just a little more okay mm -hmm. I, okay so we in in one day we organized with the community resource food for the poor the organization the women organized hot work hot work cooking food um carpenters were building windows and doors i love the description of the food and uh, <laughs> I love the description of the food being the food. Oh yes, and Miss Dolores the cook was, you know, boiling coca tea and you know, the callaloo and, and, and dumpling chicken back. All of that was happening on that day. And at the end of the day, by nightfall, the house was constructed mm -hmm. for Marcia. Mm -hmm. And everyone felt proud. And in, but I wanted to say, continue by saying, in the true spirit of love, support and sharing. Mm -hmm. Community, though sometimes torn apart by gang violence, came together to support one of their own. Mm -hmm. Some of the women who came out were themselves victims of domestic abuse, but didn't yet have the strength to leave their own situations. They were happy for Marcy mm -hmm. and took part to facilitate assistance process for took part to facilitate assist this process for a fresh start, a new beginning. Marcio, once badly abused, had defied the odds, leaving her abuser, acquiring a skill and becoming among the best of our construction workers. Marcio, the prodigal child, had returned home. And I must say that this story was captured by CNN, who came into the community at that time and did a, uh, a documentary. Mm -hmm. They were fascinated by the process of how we were training these women in construction mm -hmm. and dominated field. And they were construction workers in mm -hmm. the toilets, which later some of us participated in a program in Uganda to help them to build those toilets. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, so yes. CNN and People's Count um, carried that story. And to me, I must say that Marcia is um, a certified mason. She gets mm -hmm. tracks to build houses. Mm -hmm. Totally transformed her, her lives. So this story, I, I am hoping, will inspire mm -hmm. other women who are themselves abused. Mm -hmm. They can have the resilience to transform their own situation. Mm -hmm. oh. mm -hmm. so, yes. Thanks for asking me to do that. You're welcome. So that is certainly that that's a story of of a, a, a triumph in 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 the community. Yes. But yes. but there there were trials, uh, hard tugging moments, and mm -hmm. I I I know that there were times when even you had doubts about yourself and you questioned your identity as a Rastafarian woman, as a, as a spiritual being, a person of faith. In, in the chapter, Images of Righteousness, you, you, you say, quote, I was tired of being judged and placed in a box for my appearance, end of quote. And I, and I wonder, in those moments, how, 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 did, you, how, did, you, how did you overcome those, those self-doubts of who you are? Um, oh, good question. <laughs> no, I, I never doubted. Mm -hmm. Spirituality. I've never doubted my spirituality and my relationship with the Creator. That has always been intact. Mm -hmm. Never doubted that. Mm -hmm. But I, as humans, you want to be accepted. You want to be the 
accepted in the community that you live, the mm -hmm. community that you worship, mm -hmm. peers. Mm -hmm. and, and so as a Rastafarian, uh, a young Rastafarian at the time, at mm -hmm. the time, I wanted to be accepted and acceptance was important for me so because I doubted. I wasn't that, I didn't feel accepted. Mm -hmm. I was always judged and criticized because of my dress code. I didn't own one single thing looking African. Mm -hmm. my, and it never helped that my best friends were decked out in African clothes. And here I was looking very European. I've always liked mascara and makeup and mm -hmm. just let my locks fly. Mm -hmm. so I didn't look, I didn't fit into the box that they had constructed for me on an impression. Mm -hmm. I was a little bit too tight. My husband was always complaining, looking too sensual. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and, and for me, um, so that kind of criticism got to me. And, and this day in particular, mm -hmm. um, what helped me to overcome that was offering a Rastafarian sister mm -hmm. One morning, because I saw that she needed a ride. She had bags and pants and brooms. And I stopped my truck and said, Can I offer you a ride? Mm -hmm. and at me, and she saw the locks out flying all over the place. I said, No, 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 go cover your locks before you can talk to me. Mm -hmm. And um, and so that was just another example of how I was treated. And mm -hmm. from my husband saying, You, you need to dress. Your skirt needs to not to be so close. You need to be looser. The dress needs to come down here. So you don't need a scar. You don't need the lipstick. Mm -hmm. um, so I was society dread, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and then going to work on that day. Mm -hmm. And on that fateful day, mm -hmm. what happened, what evolved throughout the day was that there was gang war. And the two major gangs sent word to me. Mm -hmm. Mr. Angela, we want you to leave today because mm -hmm. we're going to be firing shots at each other. First, the top young sent the message mm -hmm. because we don't want you and your staff to be caught in the crossfire. Mm -hmm. Then the other young sent the message. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And it was as if this day, this Friday, was a day that I was being ordered about. Yes. In leave, leave, leave. And um and so I felt, what is this? And I felt that we were just tired of the violence. We were tired of always diving under the table. Mm -hmm. There was gunshot, tired to be told, leave now and so on. And, um, and, and on that day, um, instead of leaving, mm -hmm. I started to pray. I got one of the sheets from the clinic and I wrapped my head, went down to my knees and I started to pray for them. Mm -hmm. And I, I felt this urge to take off my the, the, the cross that I wore, the mm -hmm. cross, cross that I would mm -hmm. give it to one of the young members as a last effort to provoke his consciousness mm -hmm. and aware of how they were killing each other. Mm -hmm. And so so before I left and I saw one of them out there with the gun, I I just handed and said, take this. Mm -hmm. um, coming to work. And and so we left. Mm -hmm. Coming back to work the Monday morning, and it was just peace. And what is this peace? Mm -hmm. On Friday, we saw both of you said leave. Mm -hmm. we, we were going to shoot out. We were going to be a shoot out. What created this peace? And um, and when he described that, when he got the the chain mm -hmm. at the gun mm -hmm. with the cross, mm -hmm. the gun felt heavy. Mm -hmm. And he has had that gun as his favorite for years, and I've always been able to use it. Mm -hmm. And so he was forced, he, he couldn't, once he had it, it was heavy, and he, and he tested it. He put down the cross, and the gun was light. Mm -hmm. And when he had it, but once he had it together, he couldn't. And mm -hmm. he was convinced that it meant something. Right. To him. Mm -hmm. He got the message, that connection. Mm -hmm. And so, Instead, he put down the gun and ties it with a white cloth and put up his hand, surrender, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. walked down the road with the other guys beaming at him, and mm -hmm. no one fired a shot. Mm -hmm. created peace. Mm -hmm. For me, that was just wow. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and 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 it changed it it i i said okay so this is a day when i was told that i should cover my locks mm -hmm. that i was told that i was not dressed as a rasta woman should mm -hmm. this is the day god spoke to me mm -hmm. And I responded and I answered because I, I knew I had that connection. Mm -hmm. And so that day in what transpired that day and the peace that evolved on a day that I doubted my identity, am I Rasta enough? What is Rasta? Mm -hmm. Is the dress code? What, what is religion? Mm -hmm. Knowledge of the scripture. Mm -hmm. Is it your dress code, your ability to recite Psalms and 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 so on. Mm -hmm. So for me, I've never ever again doubted my spirituality or my image mm -hmm. and try to conform mm -hmm. image in any way to be accepted. Mm -hmm. From day onward to this day, mm -hmm. I've been me myself, a spiritual woman, a woman of Zion, and this is my dress. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I, I. <laughs> When I when I read that, I could visualize the, the the dons the dons meeting in the middle of the road to uh, have a, a, a peace truce yes. to end, end the, the the violence while yes. they're yes yes, yes. Mm -hmm. so it, it was powerful mm -hmm. it was powerful yeah, you know? yeah. Um, and so um, it's not just for Rastafarians it's it's Christianity it's all religion who have constructed boxes in which to place persons that you must look like this. You be a good God-fearing person. You must know the scriptures. You must dress like this. You must behave like this. What exactly is religion? And for, so for me, what is the image of, sorry, not religion. What exactly is this image of righteousness? Is mm -hmm. it those things or is it your connection to the most high? Mm -hmm. God. And for me that day was the manifestation of who I was and that connection being important. Mm -hmm. After that, it didn't matter if I didn't conform or I didn't look. Mm -hmm. How they had constructed their little box for me. Mm -hmm. I was not entering into that box because mm -hmm. I didn't have it. Well, let me, let me, box let me. <laughs> if it's not of God, the box that I got that the relationship is uppermost and God, me and God, mm -hmm. your box because I'm not going to fit in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Christians would have never and would never trod mm -hmm. communities mm -hmm. work in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They would never go there. You go there, you're having a Labor Day project and they're keeping church. You say, come and join. Help us to have a homework program. Help us to minister. No, no, no. Their ministry is in the church for a better life mm -hmm. after death. Mm -hmm. My relationship with the creator, my spirituality tells me that we can have a better life here on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. What I'm working about. Yes. So right here on planet Earth is where the better life is. And we have to work towards it. And that's my spirituality and my godliness and my relationship. Mm -hmm. Not going to fit in a box. <laughs> let, let, let me let me use this opportunity to remind <laughs> viewers who are who are tuned in to us and listening to us that uh, they can if they have any questions or comments that they can type them into the Q and A box and we will read them aloud during the Q and A session and they can also send questions to ssv dot adbcc at gmail dot com and and since we've been having this conversation a question came in asking how has the role of ngos changed over the years and how does how, how do you see your their role changing in 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 a post covid period the ngos have always played a very important role very good question i should say mm -hmm. ngo has always played a very important um role in that the NGOs are not politically affiliated mm -hmm. the political party. Mm -hmm. And because of their non-biased approach, mm -hmm. are able to reach a wider 
participant, a wider group of people in which to help because they are non-biased. Mm -hmm. So whereas government or the government of the day is seen as working with prejudice, mm -hmm. sometimes do not address all the issues that their the larger constituents face because of who is the ruling party. Mm -hmm. NGOs have always played an important role in development. Mm -hmm. Post-COVID, the problem is that the reduction from um, developing countries to mm -hmm. NGO happened um, because of the human index um, thing in which we it said it was said that Jamaica and countries in the Caribbean were now developing countries mm -hmm. in need of the help that we had before. Mm -hmm. And those measurements as um, the mortality ratio, education, and so on, mm -hmm. understanding how the pockets of, of, of poverty, the disparity between rich, the small minority rich, mm -hmm. and large minority, large mm -hmm. majority of poor. Mm -hmm. um, so NGOs played an important role in their reach to the people, their reach to the marginalized, their intimate relationship with people. Mm -hmm. And, and post-COVID, there will continue to be the need for NGOs to continue to reach people in a way that is non-prejudiced, non-partisan, and, and, and very intimate, understanding their needs and representing their needs for government um, funding. Mm -hmm very much needed and, and more so when you look at education now mm -hmm. um, the in how things will change with COVID where there will be reduction in classroom mm -hmm. and there and and because there will be reduction in classroom there will be online education mm -hmm. okay but that is with the assumption that the parents themselves can read mm -hmm. messages that you send mm -hmm with the assumptions that the children can read mm -hmm. that you're giving them. Mm -hmm. And so NGOs, the role of NGO to reach and become creative mm -hmm. in addressing these issues mm -hmm. is more needed than ever before. Mm -hmm. in, in programs that meet the needs of people at a very intimate level where government in their broader generalize, generalization mm -hmm. sometimes do not get. Mm -hmm. Because for me, as an NGO manager, leader, integrated management, I am looking at exactly what I just said. Mm -hmm. Parents, mm -hmm. talking about you're going to equip them with tablets, you're going to equip them with the resources, mm -hmm. parents can use that. Mm -hmm. Parents have teenage children that are there that given COVID can come to help and to show them and to understand mm -hmm. the work that has been given. Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. send messages on somebody WhatsApp, you mm -hmm. and they can read it. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yeah. So there is need for mm -hmm. the to continue to be vigilant in their work in reaching people at the very intimate level. Mm -hmm. Greater outcome than any government can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is another uh, quest. What are the links? What other links, what other books do you have planned and will it be linked to your first? That's a question that just came in. Okay, um, good question, thank you. I have just completed my children's book um, and it's called Amelia Disappears. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's um, while it is a fiction, all the stories that I've just written in Signs and Wonders, are stories of people triumph and um, their challenges. Mm -hmm. um, Amelia disappears. Mm -hmm. The age group between age and 10. So I think of my granddaughter and how she us this story. Mm -hmm. In recognition that we don't meet as a collective anymore to tell the children Duppy story and Anansi story and Big Boy story. And mm -hmm. those. there is the need for us to promote those stories that children can read in the absence of when we were small and the gathering underneath the tree and somebody would be telling you the, the story. Mm -hmm. So Amelia disappears, capture 
that setting of a child, children going to the standpipe to catch, catch water, and always under a wongo tree, you always have a duppy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and uh -huh. so on. So I don't want to tell the story too much, but it's, um, it's complete. It's mm -hmm. now, the, the illustrator is now putting together mm -hmm. the pictures to go along with it. So it should be up very soon. My, my third book that I am currently writing will be more of development work. Mm -hmm best practices because I think that is so needed mm -hmm. um, and a mixture of the things that are, I'm passionate about oh, um, religion and um, plays out especially in relationship mm -hmm. and so on so yeah my third book will be out soon the second one Amelia disappears should be out sometime this year and it's 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 interesting that your that your first book is 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 the children's book that you that you now have working yes. on. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. It, it was actually my first book. I I wrote that years ago, and I submitted um, that book for competition. As I did submit Signs and Wonders to the American Best Book Competition mm -hmm. in 2019, and I got the award for it's among the um, finalists, top ten finalists mm -hmm. for 2,000 books. Mm -hmm. So that was a great achievement for me. I submitted my children's book as well, but I got the, the reviews and the feedback to make it be more focused and, and smaller for a age group between age eight to 10 because of children's um, attrition. You have to think of the parents who's going to read the story to them in the night. It can't be too long because chances are poor mommy is tired or daddy is tired. <laughs> so the story can't be too long. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the feedback from the children writers was very mm -hmm. instrumental for me to wheel and come again mm -hmm. and writing this book, which is now completed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Well, we have some more questions. Let's see. So as one as one dawn dies, another arises, and different values and a different and different vendettas, which means a new war. Do you think there will ever truly? be peace okay um good question thank you there is one organize one organization by itself mm -hmm. cannot change peace mm -hmm. the issue of violence comes from deep-rooted issues of poverty social degradation lack of access to education employment and so violence while it is a social ill that is within that we live with mm -hmm. we have to always address the issues because if we can save all the time into these communities mm -hmm. save lives through our program these are tangible sometimes it's it's you can't count how many lives you've changed mm -hmm. because they're not homicide rate. That is so easy to change. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the deliverables and, and the impact that you have made mm -hmm. cannot count them. But community transformation, when you have persons that are going to school, that are working, you have a stable environment that you can live. It is always the reason to continue to do what you're doing, to continue to educate, to continue to empower persons so that they can make better life choices and decision. Mm -hmm. It is mm -hmm. something that will not be stopping overnight because the broader picture is there. Mm -hmm. The inequalities mm -hmm. that create these situation remains with us. Mm -hmm. And so it is a concerted effort with not just the NGO, it is macro programs. When you look at these countries, how much do they pay out for loans? How much do they invest? for education and social programs. Mm -hmm. We're talking about advocacy to change it. Mm -hmm. It's about macro policies, trade, all of those things, our borders, mm -hmm. open the guns from coming in because we don't make guns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it is a concerted effort between macro, micro community and all hands on deck if mm -hmm. we want to create a better community and a better generation. It is ongoing work. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
the, the, the questions are coming in fast and, and, and furiously. <laughs> what, what were some of the key defining moments that led you to the path you traveled in community empowerment and helped you to overcome the challenges? Good question. It's, it's finding, it goes back to me finding my purpose. Mm -hmm. Very early age, um, growing up with my grandparents, growing up in a community that you, you know, community that you were faced with um, racism and classism, mm -hmm. um, within even the church that you worship. Mm -hmm. It was not a surprise when I gravitated towards a religion that worshiped a God that looked like me. Mm -hmm. That was important. Mm -hmm. And so in finding myself and my purpose, it was important, it became important to continue to work in community transformation, mm -hmm. in, in persons leveling the playing field mm -hmm. so that we could have more mentors, we could change, we could have generational change. Mm -hmm. Real generational change in continuing, like you passing on a button of empowerment and mm -hmm. transformation. It's a continuum. It's mm -hmm. not with one person, it has to continue. The work we do in community transformation, the work we do in empowering our youth has to continue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our generation has got to change. Identity building of young men mm -hmm. to love themselves because always the media is sending you mission, messages, images, subliminal messages. Mm -hmm. You're black and you're ugly. Mm -hmm. Black come with ugly. If this mm -hmm. pretty, so you're black, but you're pretty. She black. She pretty. Mm -hmm. but she a rasta, but she look good. Mm -hmm. Hello. Yes. Yes. Those images mm -hmm. people are faced with. Mm -hmm. You know, you go into the community and you bash people who are bleaching. Mm -hmm. But when you look at society and their opportunities for getting a job, mm -hmm. to even go as a retailer. Mm -hmm. you put a, light skin to work in a bar mm -hmm. girls will tell you when we have done the research mm -hmm. they get better jobs in the bars when they are a browning they earn more money when mm -hmm. they bleach and brown and when they stop bleaching and dark skin how much jobs do they get mm -hmm. the images mm -hmm. and we have a lot of work to do to build the confidence and identity mm -hmm. of our race of our young people so that they can be confident of who they are, mm -hmm. love themselves, love the skin that they are in, in any shape and form, mm -hmm. and confident. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, another question, you have stated that the names used in your book has mm -hmm. been changed, but have you ever confront, have you ever been confronted by any of the actual persons in the book? And if so, what has been their reception? Um, great question. Now, since this book has um, been written, or even when I was writing the book, I have been bombarded. That is why there's going to be a second book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Persons that say, Miss Angela, did you write about me? Miss Angela, I hope you write about me. <laughs> <laughs> did you write about my story? Mm -hmm. I get a call from and I can call her Rosalie Matbean, who's now a, a nurse in Chicago that came from our school in the community. She said, Miss Angela Mayor, you're writing a book, you write about me. I said, no, Rosalie, I couldn't. I've already had finished. She said, mm. <laughs> but people are asking, when are you going to write my story? Mm -hmm. Because they see themselves, they are honored that mm -hmm. I have their voice. Yes. That no persons know of their story. It helps to reduce the stigma that mm -hmm persons are out there begging, community persons are waiting and and oh, no, it's not true. Mm -hmm. Giving them an opportunity that they can improve themselves, giving them a wall, community bill houses, mm -hmm. giving them a piece of rice, them will find the chicken back. Mm -hmm. They are not waiting and hand out. Mm -hmm. That is how they have been stigmatized. Mm -hmm. They're hard working, they do two jobs, three mm -hmm. jobs. And so for me to be telling the story, they are honored, they are happy that I've used their voices mm -hmm. for young men that were in gang. Mm -hmm. um, like one of them, I, I can't use his name because he's now in a prominent 
Mm -hmm. Coming in place as an accountant. Mm -hmm. Coming in. Mm -hmm. But this young man was once, because of how bright he was, mm -hmm. this young man was the person that they used to count the bullets and the inventory and so on. Mm -hmm. And we got a job for him, and he's a proper accountant now, so I can't use those boy, those names. Mm -hmm. But they know who they are. And yes. they, thank you, Miss Angela. Mm -hmm. So it is important that the stories be heard, that persons know and have a different idea, different perspective of persons in the inner city. Mm -hmm. Feedback from donors as well have been awesome. For example, the Jamaica Self Help, who funded the organization for years, in reach the book about one of the stories where a little girl um, was successful in going to one of the tier one schools, but found it difficult mm -hmm. late because she lacked the confidence to fit in. She felt that her shoes, she smelled of poverty. Mm -hmm. Shoes look tear up, tear up. The uniform, although everybody was wearing uniform, she, mm -hmm. oh, she couldn't handle the knife and fork properly. How do you them. How do you help them to assimilate? Mm -hmm. Now we're looking at programs that teach basic etiquette. Yes. Mm -hmm. How do you sit? How do you assimilate? How do you to get that kind of confidence mm -hmm. to assimilate in schools that are traditional and you're going to be interfacing and, and mingling with persons outside of your classroom? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is another question here. It is do you believe society changed to how they treat minorities now compared to then? So do you believe society changed to how they treat minorities now compared to then? Oh, great questions. All we have to do is to look at the news and we will see mm -hmm. that racism is ugly. It's as weird, it's ugly head. And the off from racism and classism is very real and it's there. Can touch it, you can feel it. Mm -hmm. It's there for all to see when you look at the news. So that has not changed. And unfortunately, I don't know for whatever reason, I don't want to go into that. But I think that no, I don't know if it's worse or it's that social media is highlighting the problem more. Mm -hmm. I have mm -hmm. evidence to measure that. Mm -hmm. But I do know that every day, almost every day, you look at the news and you see where someone was discriminated against mm -hmm. because of their, their seem to be minority urban control. Mm -hmm. That's alive and well. It has not changed, no. Mm -hmm. Yes. You, you dedicate signs and wonders to youth, especially those growing up in marginalized communities. And, and you encourage them to read and read and read everything why why this dedication to them and then I, thanks thanks Neil. and if i go back to papa i go back to my grandfather mm -hmm. understanding as i said before the inequalities that we face mm -hmm. and marginalized youth in community who are imprisoned because of their social and economic conditions they don't go out mm -hmm. they exposure mm -hmm. Reading broadens their horizon. Mm -hmm. It takes them to a world outside of their community. Mm -hmm. Educates them. They are able now to make informed decisions about their life, wise choices. Mm -hmm. And so it is important to read and soak up everything like a sponge. Just soak it up, just read. Mm -hmm. and, and more so if you're poor. Mm -hmm. It is the only accepted way. Um, for actualization for us. If you use it, of course, there are so many stories about those persons that are excelling mm -hmm. in how much wealth, but when they go into these communities, are they accepted? Mm -hmm. The answer is no, they're alienated. They're asked to leave. Subliminal messages go back where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. When you're educated and you can assimilate and you, can, and you have confidence, mm -hmm. they do not. Mm -hmm. They do not. Yes. And yeah. so I want everyone, education is important and for marginalized youth in the ghetto, in the inner city, read, to take Do not see yourself as victim, be victors. Mm -hmm. And education can give you that power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Oh yes, eat everything. You're you're here in Canada now, and I'm wondering is it, is this a break from community development and, and peace building, or are you still involved in that work? Um, good question, um, Neil. Mm -hmm. When you are bitten by the development bug, you can't leave. Mm -hmm. So where you go to? The mm -hmm. development bug is in you. Your purpose is in you. Mm -hmm. Me being here in Canada, it's doing development work in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, now I'm collaborating with agencies, agencies like the Jamaica Self Help, to write and design programs for developing countries, not just Jamaica. Mm -hmm. So open to that. I'm open with the best practices of, of how do you design a program for social and economic intervention, for community transformation, youth empowerment, addressing abuse, all of the social ills. Mm -hmm. And I'm here, I'm, I'm doing that as well as I am writing my third book and hoping to finish it um, mm -hmm. soon. Yeah. So development book takes you, even when you're outside of the community, mm -hmm. it's it in a way that will continue to help and transform community, even when you're not there on the ground. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I, I, I want to, as we're near the, the one hour end time, I'm, I'm wondering how can participants who are tuning in to us, how, how can they get in touch with you if they want to? Okay, I, my Facebook page is, is there. Um, you give your email. That's, yeah. Mm -hmm. My email, my email address is um, Angela Stoltz, mm -hmm. zero eight at gmail dot com. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And are there are there Angela Stoltz zero eight A N G E L A one Ellen Angela S T U L T Z mm -hmm. Angela Stoltz zero eight at gmail dot com. That's right. And 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 any any parting thoughts that you want to share? Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just really want to thank mm -hmm. different book lists mm -hmm. and the center for having me here this afternoon mm -hmm. about my book, my passion mm -hmm. that I do, um, to provoke conversation after this into the bedrooms and the dining table about what can we do to help. Now that you have been informed, now that you know that there are organizations on, on the ground that is making a difference, mm -hmm. how do you do it? Will you do it? Mm -hmm. so I just really want to thank you, Neil, mm -hmm. for having me. I thank Ita and the team mm -hmm. for inviting me to share my story, to share my book. And I look forward to more discussions and um, collaborating with you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, and I'm sure I'm sure this conversation will stir mo more discussions for sure. Uh, th Thank you so much, Angela. Angela Punky Stills is the author of Signs and Wonders: so Sojourn in the Inner City: Stories of Triumph and Trials in Community Development and Peace Building. And I also want to remind participants that they can register for more events and view recorded programming by visiting adbcc.org and they can also keep up with a different book list cultural center on Facebook. Uh, follow us on Instagram at a different book list CCC and on Twitter at adbcc777. That's the, that's the address of a different book list cultural center, the People's Residence, 777 Bathurst Street. So Thank you everyone for joining us and, and thanks again, Angela. Looking forward to the children's book and looking forward to the other book that you're working on now. And thank you everyone for joining us here for a literary salon. Next Thursday, the featured author will be Sandra Williams, who is the author of A Sip of Cerisey. Uh, the boldest, taking the boldest steps. So it's a sip of Cersei tea, taking the boldest steps. And that should also prove to be very delightful. Thanks, Angela, and thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Neil. <laughs>